I suppose John Bunyan's great book written in a time of suffering when he spent so many months in Bedford jail, his famous book, The Pilgrim's Progress, is a book whose title has not only captured much that the Bible has to say about living the Christian life, but its title has captured for us also the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one true pilgrim. There are many Psalms in the Psalter in the Old Testament that were written to be sung on pilgrimage. And all of these Psalms, particularly Psalm 120 to 134, which were really a kind of unique little songbook for pilgrims going to Jerusalem, are songs that in the last analysis find their fulfillment in the one true pilgrim, Jesus Christ. One of the questions that the Old Testament keeps on asking the members of the Old Covenant community is who can really and truly make the pilgrimage into the presence of the Lord? Only the man who has clean hands and a pure heart. But none of us who are pilgrims, they confess, have that pure heart or clean hands. When Luke writes his gospel and describes for us the life and ministry, the perfect holiness and obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ, he wants us to see among the many other perspectives on Jesus, he wants us to see that our Lord Jesus Christ is the true pilgrim. He is the great pilgrim. And because he is the true and great pilgrim, two things automatically follow. The one is that his pilgrimage has as its destination Jerusalem. And the other is that on that pilgrimage he will invite others to come with him so that they, as the psalmist had said earlier, they will stand within Jerusalem and say, I was glad when he said to me, let us go. And it's these two things, wonderfully, that Luke weaves now into his narrative of the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus. Jesus, the pilgrim who has set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. And Jesus, the pilgrim who on his pilgrim way turns to one and another and says, you follow me on this pilgrimage, that we may go to Jerusalem. And that going to Jerusalem, you and I may both in different ways bear the cross. You and I, yes, in different ways may die to all that this world holds. And you and I will come to the consummation, the bliss of this pilgrimage in entering into the joy, the happiness, the power, the majesty, the final glory of the beginning of a glorious new life. And in that whole context, as I said, as we turn to the reading this evening, this ninth chapter of Luke is the great turning point in Jesus' ministry, the great turning point in the whole gospel. Simon Peter now, for the first time, has fully confessed Jesus' identity. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus has begun to speak about what that means for him to be the Messiah, how he is going to suffer and die, how the chief priests, the Pharisees, will conspire together to do him away. And now, as he has spoken of these things, he has taken Peter and James and John on a miniature pilgrimage to a miniature mountain. And there, giving them just for a moment a little open window into how his pilgrimage to Jerusalem is going to end, Jesus is gloriously transfigured before them. It seems as though the effulgent glory of his true identity as the Son of God seeps almost physically, it seems, through his pores. 
And he gives them just as now they are entering into the Via Dolorosa, the pathway of suffering and the pathway of discipleship. He gives them a glimpse of that glory that awaits him as the true pilgrim and in which they will share if they will come truly and follow him. And so while the shadow of the cross has been placed over the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus from the very beginning of his life, it becomes clear now in the story of Luke's gospel that the outline of that destiny, the outline of the shadow of the cross falls now more clearly and more heavily upon him as the sun of his final destiny in Jerusalem shines more brightly as they progress day by day nearer to the denouement of his whole ministry. So that this passage that we were reading this evening in many ways sets the tone, sets the compass for the rest of Jesus' ministry. And I want us to look at it really under the three sections that we find in the passage that is before us. The first in verse 51, the second in verses 52 to 56, and the third in verses 57 to 62. In verse 51, we are told how Jesus begins his journey to Jerusalem. In verses 52 to 56, we are told about the reaction of one particular Samaritan village. And in verses 57 through to 62, we are told about Jesus' call to discipleship. Let's begin by thinking a little about this journey to Jerusalem. Earlier on in Jesus' teaching in chapter 9, in verse 22, he had made it clear that the end of this pilgrimage was going to be an end of suffering and sacrifice. The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. As a good teacher, and he certainly was a good teacher, he realized that they weren't able to take everything in at once. Indeed, that little section we read later on in Luke 18 indicates that even the little he had spoken to them about, they weren't really able to take in. And so at this stage, all he gives them is the broad brush outline of the sufferings that he is going to experience. But now, some days later, Jesus makes clear that this experience is going to take place, yes, in, of all places, the holy city of Jerusalem. It is in the holy city that this is going to happen. It is in the place of pilgrimage that the Son of God is going to be set aside and crucified. And so, in a way that became very obvious to the disciples, perhaps by the new tone in Jesus' voice, perhaps by these moments when he seemed isolated from them and obviously deep in contemplation and meditation. It was obvious to them now that Jesus was heading deliberately for Jerusalem. In the older translation of verse 51, Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And the rest of the gospel actually traces the meanderings of that journey. For example, in verse 51, we are told that he steadfastly sets his face to go to Jerusalem. But then in the next chapter, in verse 38, we're told that Jesus and his disciples are now on their way to Jerusalem and they come to the village where Martha lived. And then in chapter 13, verse 22, he takes up the theme again. And we are told in chapter 13 and verse 22 that Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. 
And by the same chapter, verse 33, he says, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. As the story moves on, we find that Jesus is still heading for Jerusalem in chapter 17, verse 11. When he heals the ten leprous men, it was on his way to Jerusalem when he was traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Turn over to chapter 18, verse 31. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that's written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He approaches Jericho in verse 35, on his way to Jerusalem. He is passing through, we are told, in chapter 19, verse 1, on his way to Jerusalem. And in verse 11 of chapter 19, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. And later on in verses 28 and 29, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. In verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he broke down in tears. And then finally, the pilgrimage comes to the beginning of the end. In verse 45, he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. But I wonder if you noticed as we read this passage the manner in which Luke introduces this part of the pilgrimage. It is really a very striking, unusual, totally unexpected way. He says, as the time approached for Jesus to be crucified, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, you know that's not what it says, isn't it? Notice what it says. You could so easily just slide over it. As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven. Why does he say that strange thing when all the focus of this part of the gospel seems to be narrowing down to Jesus' crucifixion in Jerusalem? Well, it is because, as Luke understands, the crucifixion of Jesus, if I can put it this way, is a means to a greater end. The crucifixion of Jesus is the means by which he will take away our sin. But it's the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus to the right hand of the Father that is the way in which Jesus is going to fulfill the promise of John the Baptist with which this gospel begins. That this is the one who will baptize his people with the Holy Spirit. This is the one who, when he is taken up into heaven, having finished his work, will send down the Holy Spirit to begin the new community of God, the new humanity, the new creation that God is bringing into being by his Son, the second man and the last Adam. And so Jesus' eyes are not simply fixed upon Calvary and the suffering. His eyes are fixed beyond Calvary in the resurrection and the ascension and the glory. Just exactly as the author of Hebrews says, remember in Hebrews chapter 12 at the beginning, it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross and despised the shame. And now he is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God on high. And he is pouring out his Holy Spirit. And he is bringing people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation into his kingdom. So that from the very beginning, Luke understands that our Lord Jesus Christ, over whose life the shadow of the cross has now fallen so heavily, is not going to die on the cross simply as the end of a terrible tragedy, but as the breakthrough into a glorious victory. And it is His great purpose to send His Spirit. In a sense, What Luke understands is that Jesus is making that pilgrimage, not to the earthly Jerusalem, but to the heavenly Jerusalem, 
For the sake of his people, he is the only one who through blood, sweat, tears, the suffering of the cross, the bearing of our sins, can break through into the holiest place of all where God is. But when he has ascended into heaven where God is, he has broken through into his presence in order to leave a gaping hole there so that others may join him. And through that gaping hole in heaven, he sends down his Holy Spirit. And look both in the gospel he writes and in his second volume in the Acts of the Apostles, understands that Jesus always has victory, triumph, glory, success in view. The Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering and sorrow for the Lord Jesus, is actually the way of victory for the Lord Jesus. And this is the reason why, because so much was at stake. We are told in verse 51, rather woodenly in the NIV translation, Jesus resolutely set out to go to Jerusalem. It literally means Jesus stiffened his face. Jesus stiffened his face. Think about the significance of that for a moment if you're a Christian believer. Here's another indication. We've seen a number of them in our study in Luke's Gospel. Here is another indication that Luke understands very clearly that the obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ to his Father was always perfect. The obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ to his Father was perpetual. But the obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ was also progressive. Remember how he said at the end of Luke chapter 2 that Jesus grew, not simply in stature, but in wisdom. As he grew physically, as fresh challenges came his way that hadn't come his way. His obedience to his Father expanded into all these new experiences. From that point of view, we can say that his obedience to his Father, which was perfect and perpetual, was also progressive. As his Father made fresh calls for more demanding obedience, Jesus rose to those fresh calls. That's why in Philippians 2, Paul says he was not only obedient, but he was obedient even to death, even death on a cross. His obedience was perfect, but his obedience to his Father was always on the increase. So much so that in John's Gospel, Jesus says this amazing thing. He says, the reason my Father loves me is because I lay down my life for the sheep. I think that is one of the most precious statements Jesus ever made. I think if you think of what he said that really meant a great deal to him, that meant a great deal to him. That even on the cross, when his obedience, he would feel forsaken by his Father. He knew that just at that point, his Father was looking down on him and saying to him, I have never loved you so much as I love you now because you have never obeyed me so fully as you do now. I have now asked everything from you and you have given it to me. And so a development took place that the disciples noticed. Luke must have heard this from the disciples. Luke was not present with the disciple band. He was not an eyewitness himself, but he interviewed eyewitnesses. And there must have been talk among the disciples that made them remember this. Do you remember just that period after the transfiguration when we noticed that something had happened to Jesus? And it seemed as though somehow or another he had gone on to a different plateau. As God showed him more and more of what it would involve to become the savior of sinful men and women, he rose to the occasion. And that perfect obedience became so gloriously progressive. 
that it became clear in him that the commitment of a lifetime to the obedience to his father was a commitment that took an entire lifetime to fulfill. That's something you and I need to learn. If that's true of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it is abundantly true of you and of me. That true commitment to the Lord is never the decision merely of a moment. There is no greater mistake a professing Christian can make than to assume that because he made a decision 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, that that is the only thing that matters. The thing that matters is that that decision you made 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago is a decision in obedience to which you now, today, are so gloriously increased that your commitment to Jesus Christ then looks small and miniature by comparison to your commitment to Jesus Christ now. And the tragedy of many of our lives is that the very reverse is true, and we know it. We look back to those days and we think I was gloriously committed to Jesus Christ then in a way I am not now. Nothing could be a clearer evidence to me that I'm not really walking with the Lord than that my commitment actually goes in the reverse direction from the direction in which His commitment was going. You know, that's a very significant word of challenge to all of us. Commitment to the Lord when you are 17, 16, 15, in the first flush of life. That's one thing. Commitment to the Lord when you are 30 is another thing. Increased commitment to the Lord when you are 40 is yet another thing when you are 50, when you are 60, when you are 70. And here set before us, as Luke is so interested in the question of discipleship, is this great principle that the obedience of Jesus Christ to his heavenly Father was an obedience in which he perpetually walked, but an obedience that he progressively fulfilled. You understand, dear ones, that's how it is. If you're not increasingly obedient to the Lord, you're not obedient to the Lord. He wants to be able to ask more of you, not less of you. Because that's the way he dealt with his son. That's the way he deals with all of his sons and daughters. So this is a great moment in Luke's gospel, and what an amazing insight this is on Luke's part, that Jesus now came to what must have been a kind of miniature crisis in his life. That decision, that decision to be unreservedly committed to the Lord's way, that he'd given public testimony to in baptism. That was being tested all along, and his father was saying to him all along, more, son, more, stretching you, stretching you, stretching you, stretching you, stretching you, until at the last he was physically stretched on the cross till he could be stretched no more, and was, as Luke's friend and companion Paul would later say, obedient even to the death on the cross. So the journey to Jerusalem is one in which Jesus steadfastly, resolutely sets out. But the second thing that we are told about in this section is the reaction to Jesus in this Samaritan village. He sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village, verse 52, to get things ready for him. Now, it seems from wherever exactly Jesus was that the direct way to Jerusalem was to go through Samaria. But most of us know there were standing hostilities between the Jews and the Samaritans. Hostilities 
uh, akin, one might say, to the hostilities that at least in the past there were between Protestants and Roman Catholics in Glasgow. Different ways of worship, different Bibles, different liturgies, different attitudes, and mutual hatred. Perhaps it wasn't surprising then that Jesus met the result that he did. But as you step back again from this passage, you you notice two things. First of all, you notice what I'm going to call the graciousness of the visitor. Here he is coming to the Samaritan village, and he sends messengers on ahead to get things ready. That was really an act of great thoughtfulness and courtesy. Jesus and his disciple band made up at least 13, himself and the 12 apostles. There are almost certainly more, perhaps quite a crowd following. The B&Bs in this Samaritan village would have been under some strain and stress, even if these were Samaritans arriving. But considering what was on his mind... Considering that the cross was on his mind, there is an unusual, there is a a sweet poise and sense of command and sense of control in our Lord Jesus as he deals with this situation. There is a graciousness of approach from which we surely need to learn some lessons. But the graciousness of the visitor was met by the gracelessness of the villagers. Jesus and his disciples were not welcome, we're told, verse 53, because he was heading for Jerusalem. Because he was heading for Jerusalem. What does that mean? Well, it means two things. It means they rejected him because he was committed to Jerusalem. But it's not only an expression of their rejection of him, it's, it's an expression of a deep spiritual tragedy on their part. He was heading for Jerusalem for one particular purpose, to die for the sins of the world. He was going to Jerusalem in order to be the Savior who could bring these Samaritans to God, who could bring these Samaritans the forgiveness of sins, who could do for these Samaritans all the things He had promised to do to the woman that He'd met at the well in Samaria, described in John chapter 4. He was going to Jerusalem so that through His death and resurrection and ascension, making that gaping hole into heaven, he could pour down from heaven the rivers of living water that would satisfy the thirst of that needy and sinful Samaritan woman. And those rivers of living water would quench the thirst of these needy Samaritans. But they rejected Jesus just at the very point at which Jesus had come to be the Savior of sinners. It was not only extraordinary gracelessness, it was amazing, absolutely amazing blindness and misunderstanding and spiritual catastrophe. And it led to the gut reaction of the disciples particularly James and John, when the disciples James and John saw this, I wonder what they saw. Verse 52, he sent messengers on ahead. The villagers said, you're not welcome here. Was it the way these messengers came trooping back out of the village with their heads down? Was it the way they spat in the ground or kicked the dust off their feet? But when James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them. They're almost certainly thinking of an incident in the life of Elijah when Elijah had met with forces that despised 
the grace and favor of God, and God through Elijah had come in awful judgment, and Elijah had called down fire from heaven, and people had been consumed in judgment by that fire. And James and John, the apostle of love, notice, is caught up in this. John, the apostle of love, turns to Jesus and he says, do you want us to call down fire from heaven like Elijah did? Do you want us to do the biblical thing? Eh? Isn't that the biblical thing? Elijah called down fire. Let's us call down fire. And they didn't understand the meaning of John the Baptist's words, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. They still didn't understand that Jesus himself was going to take the fire of the baptism of divine judgment when he was baptized with that baptism of blood on the cross. And the only baptism he was going to pour out in his ascension and victory was the baptism of grace and conversion and new life and regeneration and peace with God and fellowship with God. They still didn't understand what he had come to do. They neither understood the meaning of his death nor the meaning of his coming. They couldn't get hold of what the cross was really for. The cross was really for the forgiveness of sins. It was the pathway to giving his people the Holy Spirit, and they still couldn't understand what he was talking about. As he later says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But the problem was they didn't understand the cross. Because they didn't understand the cross, they didn't understand the grace. And because they didn't understand the grace, they couldn't extend that grace or pray for that grace. Have mercy upon these Samaritans who are rejecting you, Lord Jesus. Have mercy on them. No, not at all. Consume them. How dare they reject you? I say they didn't understand the cross. That's our problem. Oh, it is our problem. We don't understand the cross. It's going to become evident they weren't the only ones who didn't understand the cross. But they certainly didn't understand the cross. And the reason they didn't understand the cross was they couldn't really yet see clearly why they needed it for themselves. And that's the problem. It's always the problem. We don't understand the cross. The cross. The cross. Even as Christians, we don't understand the cross. And here they were, miniature Christians, and they didn't understand the cross. And that leads to the third section here in Luke chapter 9, in which all this is flushed out in a series of interviews that Jesus has with different people. And in those interviews, he is calling them very clearly to discipleship. And it's fascinating now, you see, to see how this all fits together. Verse 51, Jesus is going to the cross. Verse 52 to verse 56, the disciples can't understand the cross. They can't yet see how it is that Jesus has come into the world to seek and to save the lost, not to condemn the world, but to be the Savior. And it all plays out in the response there is to Jesus' call to discipleship. Because what is really happening here is that as Jesus is on the way to the cross, 
he pauses with different ones who either say, we'll go with you, or to whom he says, you go with me. And the key word here is the word follow. Verse 57, one says to him, I will follow you. Verse 59, he says to another, follow me. Verse 61, another says, I will follow you. It's all about following Jesus. But where is Jesus going? Jesus is going to the cross. And so now, in addition to disciples who don't understand what the cross is all about, here are people who are being called to discipleship and draw back because they refuse to enter into what the cross means for their discipleship. Verse 58, a man who volunteers for discipleship, but when the story is spelt out, one has the impression that Jesus is asking him if he is willing to share the sacrifices involved in the discipleship. I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, well, will you? I'm not sure it's really possible to be a Christian without saying to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Is it? Is it really possible to say Jesus is my Lord without saying, I will follow you wherever you go? Well, will you? Will you follow him wherever he goes? And here is another. Jesus says to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. First let me go and bury my father. And here is a hard saying in verse 60. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. The most comfortable way to understand these words is that the man is saying, I have got certain responsibilities and I need to fulfill them, so let me wait until all those responsibilities are fulfilled and my father has died and then I'll come and follow you. It's actually more likely that what the man is saying is, My father has died, let me go and bury him. And Jesus says, Burying your father was one of the great obligations on a Jewish son. Following me takes priority on the greatest of your family obligations. That cuts deeply, doesn't it? There is no domesticating Jesus of Nazareth here, adding him into my life in order to provide some balance, in order to provide some religious fulfillment. No, says Jesus, if there is a place where the highest of your family priorities crosses the clearest of my calls, then you must give my call absolute priority. Absolute priority. My, that's a challenge to us if we are in a family, isn't it? It would be a challenge to those of you who are parents. If Jesus Christ came to your child and said to your child as he or she grew up, I must so be the absolute priority of your life that even those things that naturally you would want to do out of honor and respect for your parents, I am asking you to yield these things up. Let me put that in context. Jesus did not ask this man, Jesus did not ask this man to do something he wasn't prepared to do himself. Jesus went to the cross, and he had a choice. Jesus went to the cross rather than, listen to me, rather than fulfilling his filial obligations to his mother when the call of God came. And it's a challenge to us, whichever side of family life 
we live on, if we are children, we have distinct responsibilities to our parents. But those responsibilities to our parents must never be allowed to take priority over the call of Jesus Christ to serve him and to spread the kingdom. You see, Jesus, as he goes to the cross and calls us to go with him to the cross, Yes, he is going to die in order to be a sacrifice for our sins, but if you and I are going to go to the cross, then we too are going to die. There is no share in resurrection life that doesn't come to us through sharing in Jesus' death, through sharing in Jesus' sacrifice, through, yes, at times the agony of things that are precious to us being torn from us, Because he has some higher purpose for my life. And then there is the one who comes and says, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Now, this is another interesting statement because this is exactly what Elisha had said when Elijah called him. You remember, he said, Fine, I'll follow Elijah, accept the call, but let me go home first. Let me deal with my family obligations first of all. Let me say goodbye to my family. And Elijah said, off you go. What have I done? Off you go. And Jesus is underlining that the loyalty of Elisha to Elijah, which is one of the great loyalties of the whole Old Testament story, It's like the loyalty of Joshua to Moses, of Jonathan to David, of Timothy to the Apostle Paul. This is one of the great, great bonding realities of the whole Bible story. Two men bound together in the glorious work. And Jesus is saying to this man, you need to understand that my summons to absolute loyalty, my summons to total discipleship, my summons to unreserved obedience is a higher summons than the summons of an Elijah. This is the summons of the living God in human flesh. I will follow you, Lord, but first let me The spiritual grammar of that's all wrong, isn't it? I will follow you, but first let me. I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Is it, is it really like this that he says, no one who puts his hand to the plow That was Elisha, actually. He was plowing when Elijah came on him. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Like Paul putting behind him everything that belongs to the past, gazing into the future service of Jesus Christ. The truth of the gospel is that Jesus Christ asks more of you than you ever imagined. And he asks far more of you than you've ever given. And he's going to ask far more of you as you progress in your obedience to him, as your obedience to him becomes more and more like the obedience of Jesus to his heavenly Father, then more and more and more is going to be asked of you in the way of discipleship, in the way of cross-bearing, because he understands that you're capable of sustaining more and you have an appetite for more. Until all on the altar you lay. Some of you will know the story of William Burden of Yale. 
young man who today would have been a multimillionaire in his early 20s. And when he was about 23 or 24, he gave away the equivalent of about 10 million pounds in today's money and went off to be a missionary. And he died at the age of 26 in Egypt. And his last words, no reserve, no regret, no delays. I think the greatest tragedy of a professing Christian's life might be that over my tombstone might be written the words, regrets, Reserves, delays. As God speaks to us through this word, he speaks to us not in a general kind of way, but in a particular kind of way. He always speaks in a particular kind of way. He always puts his finger on particular things in particular lives. He moves, as it were, through the pews, through the chairs, and he says, now this is how what this passage says applies to you here, now, tonight, today, this week. My friend, over what are you writing? Reserve, regret, delay. Jesus has set his face to go to the cross. Every day the Father is asking more and more and more of him until he will be wholly stretched out in obedience to his Father. That's the way he works with his sons. And that's the way he wants to work with you.